We're going to start in here together for a couple minutes, and then we'll split you up by panels. Um, thank you for being here this morning. I'm, I keep trying to break Columbia. Um, so I lied to you yesterday, the archive materials are now here, thanks to Maddie and the team from University of Puget Sound. They will be in the faculty room all day, so go at your leisure and check out some of the items from our archive at University of Puget Sound. Um, before some of the panels, I've been doing a little Beth's dramaturgy of why this panel, and because I wanted to be able to say something about both of this morning's panels, it's why I've asked you all to gather for a minute, and then we'll split up. Um, I have an enormous debt of thanks to give to Martha Steckety and Mark Bly for the design panel this morning. Um, together, they brought Fitz Patton into my life, and my life has been changed. Uh, if you are lucky enough to have chosen to sit towards the front, you will see some examples of a magazine that Fitz and Martha and a team of people have created on design and dramaturgy. Um, each of you will be mailed a copy of an issue for your very own, but feel free to flip through it whether you're attending this panel or not. Thank you to Fitz and Chance Magazine. They're beautiful. They're going to blow your mind. Um, what I know about design would fit in a symbol, but my experience in my day job is that most playwrights, their knowledge of design would fit in a symbol, and all they know is now I've shown up at the theater and I hate the design, which of course at that point it's too late. So I hope amongst other fabulous topics they will talk about how we can be better facilitators in people understanding what Jane Wenger said yesterday, learning to read blueprints changed her life. Um, so I'm super excited that they're all here, and Vicki's going to share some, some thoughts as a past president and then guide you through that panel. And then LGBTQ stories on stage. You know, I came of age kind of in the era of the gay play, typically written by a man. I came into my profession as an agent um, with a lot of incredible lesbian playwrights. Um, battling what they felt was an apathy towards their voices and their stories and their work, and it was a huge pleasure to be pulled into the world and to be a supporter of those stories. I've been equally blessed the last couple of years in having uh, people who are trans or genderqueer or not identifying on the um, gender spectrum in what might be thought of as the traditional way, and they have been an enormously generous conduit of conversations and questions and information for me, and probably for the first time ever in my life, I wrote an email saying, do I use male or female pronouns? And it was an incredibly hard, awkward email to write, and then the answer came back with the answer. And the second time I asked it of someone, it was easy to ask, and the third time I asked it of someone, it was even easier to ask. Um, and then I saw Shakina Solo show and w learned I'm supposed to be asking. Um, and I have found myself frequently the conduit to people um, who want to know how to have a conversation. And so I'm really excited to have had this platform to say, let's have that conversation here so you can all be conduits to your audiences, your friends, your fellow theater makers in having that conversation. So those are just a couple of thoughts between uh, about the two panels. Um, we're going to go ahead, anybody who's doing LGBTQ stories on stage, go ahead and head into the air-conditioned faculty room. Um, anybody who is doing design and dramaturgy, maybe move down front, partly so you can access Chance Magazine, but also just so they have the warmth and the love of people right in front of them. Thanks for being here. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Is this, is this thing on? Is this thing on? Uh, mic's on. Oh, here we are. We're live. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this panel on design and dramaturgy here at LMDA's uh, 30th anniversary conference at Columbia University. I, I want to welcome everyone in the room and also everyone who's watching. Uh, we're live streaming on HowlRound as well. Yay! Welcome, world! Um, my name is Vicki Stroich, and I'm the executive director of Alberta Theatre Projects in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, I'm also the most recent past president of LMDA, and. Um, 
as this is our 30th anniversary, I've been asked to take just a moment at the, begin at the beginning of this to reflect on my experience with LMDA. So I'm just going to take a moment to do that. Um, my first LMDA conference was in Vancouver in 2002. And my first session was a hot topic section session. And um, anyone who knows, uh, who's been in a room with uh, a meeting or a gathering with Brian Court knows what this is all about. Uh, we go around the room, we say who we are, where we're from, and we talk about a burning question that we have about the theater, our work, the world, and more often than not, how those three things intersect. At my turn, again, this is my first conference, I stood up, I said my name, I said where I worked, I said who my mentors were, Bob White and Vanessa Porches, and then I said, I was just so happy and lucky to be here. And then I sat down. And uh, Bob White, my mentor who was sitting right next to me, as I sat down, in full volume said, how long are you going to hide behind that bullshit? <laughs> if you know Bob White, you know tough love. Um, I'm not sure how many other people actually heard that in the room. Maybe a few of you were there and you did. Um, but I certainly heard that tough love loud and clear. And I kept learning by watching the people I met and admired on the LMDA board and executive and the, all the people involved with the organization over the next few years as they unapologetically claimed space, honestly questioned their work, gave strong feedback to one another, supported one another, listened passionately, and spoke up. I was lucky to be there every time we've been in the room and gathered together, yes. But to say that and just sit down did not do justice to my peers in LMDA, and it didn't do justice to my role as a dramaturg. I learned from LMDA that a dramaturg, as a dramaturg, it's my duty to be a passionate advocate, a disruptor, a constructive critic, and when necessary, a shit disturber. I've let that guide my time at LMDA, that realization. Um, it was why uh, I chose when I was chair of the Banff, committee, uh, Banff Conference Committee to, to subvert the hierarchy and erase the questions of representation on panel discussions by making the Banff Conference an unconference uh, based on an open space model. Um, where everyone was a programmer, a moderator, and a panelist. It's why I admired what turned out to be the most popular uh, topic and session proposed at that Banff conference by Liz Engelman, which was entitled Joy. Um, it was the most revelatory and valuable thing that we could speak about, and I hope we speak about it every time we gather. It's also why I admire the ECD panel just yesterday that encouraged people who, like me back in 2002, are at their first or second conference to um, speak up, to state an opinion, and to ask a question. LMDA taught me to be grateful for my peers and my mentors. Yes, absolutely. It's also taught me not to apologize for owning space, not to apologize for using my voice, or questioning the structures I see around me, including the structures of LMDA, and most especially, if you're willing to stand up and work to make LMDA even better and even stronger. And that's my reflection on this 30th anniversary. Thank you. Um, and thank you for joining me. Now we'll, we'll return to the topic. <laughs> um, I'm really thrilled to be here with this marvelous panel of people. Um, right next to me is Mr. Fitz Patton. Um, he's a sound designer based here in New York, and he's the editor of Chance Magazine, which uh, Beth mentioned a bit earlier. And Chance Magazine looks at the world through the lens of theater and design. I love that description. Uh, next to him is Martha Steckety. She's a New York-based dramaturg, the general editor and monograph editor of, Ch of Chance Magazine. Um, next to her, Rachel Hauck is a set designer here in New York City who's worked on a lot of new work. She worked at Playwrights Horizon, Signature, worked regionally at the Court Theatre, the Guthrie, OSF, to name just a few. She was also the resident designer at the O'Neill Playwrights Conference for 10 years. And next to her is Louisa Thompson. She's a scenic designer based in New York City whose work has been seen at Soho Rep, Playwrights Horizons, regionally at Berkeley Rep, La Jolla Playhouse, uh, the McCarter Theater, and again, just to name just a few. So welcome, all of you. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> Designers don't always get the applause, so we want to make sure we give them a lot here. Um, before our first question, I just want to encourage anyone who has, we don't have any, uh, I mean, design is such a visual medium. <laughs> we don't have um, a projector. So anyone who has a laptop, a phone, uh, a, a tablet with them, as we're talking, please Google, 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 Google away, um, and show your friends at the table about some of the things that we're, um, 
working on and that we're, we're talking about. Uh, our introductory question um, is uh, how would each of you describe the intersection between dramaturgy and design in the creation process and how, how does it intersect in your own work? Does anyone want to? Oh, I, I can't. We're passing back and forth, so. Um, I, I, I think the first thing uh, that I think we can all, uh, you know, we're all aware of is that, you know, we, we're all creating in the same kind of social and economic environment, which I frequently refer to as a bubble. And I am very curious and I've grown to be progressively more curious about how our economy and social structure more really acutely the way theater is organized and funded, to what degree that affects the way we break down and solve problems within theater? How does it affect the way we think about our subject? And then ultimately, how does that affect the outcome, which is you know, the production itself? But the process of making theater is far more the concern of the magazine. And it's, we're very, uh, and have grown to be progressively interested in I, I call it working across a landscape of vertical subcultures where you could say not only our professions, subcultures, architecture, theater, art, literature, playwriting, but then even within those subcultures are further smaller cultures of people who are making things and they gather around the subject, their, their work is funded, and then they kind of go in a conclave around this thing and eventually they send up the white smoke and we come and see the, the production. And what the magazine really tries to do is, in, is it tries to move across all of these very active vertical uh, production structures to excavate deeper trends and ideas that may be operating, but also to put uh, these productions in conversation with each other. And, and I think very importantly, uh, the way in which these things are monetized is completely of uh, no consequence to the magazine. So the fifth issue has a great, I mean, what I love and, and it, it's important to me, we follow a piece on the living theater which lost their space in New York City and went to the Burning Man Festival to develop a new piece of work. L literally the last thing Judith did before she died. And it's followed by an editorial shoot of the chorus girls of, of on the town. And, and, and it's a, that shoot is a very aggressive shoot, but what it gets at are placing these subcultures which really would not normally be interested in speaking to each other in direct contact. I mean, I have a lot more to say because it just continues to radiate out the issues and problems. But. And those of us at Chance can talk about our, our perspectives on Chance forever. We were just in Prague at the Prague Quadrennial talking about Chance, uh, the, a, a public talk and then a workshop, and we realized that we can talk for hours without stopping. Um, so I, com I came at this collaboration, so I'm the non-designer on the table, but a great design enthusiast. I knew this before starting working on Chance with Fitz, and it's become even more I don't know, outrageously dramatic for me during the course of working on this, on the magazine. Um, so I came at it as some, uh, came into it by invitation from Fitz um, to, to develop a section that he had a vision for that we now call monograph, uh, which is looking at someone whose career is primarily in a prior generation. Dramaturgs, what do we like to do? Research, great, he says how would you like to spend some time in Jane Greenwood's basement looking at the archives of her um, ex-husband, her husband, um, uh, Ben Edwards? Uh, it's never been written about. And I, I said, stop. I hardly know you. Yes, let's go. <laughs> uh, and that was two and a half years ago, three years ago. And we've been, I've been part of, from the side, but from my focus on words, um, uh, and great enthusiasm for the art, various design arts uh, building this magazine. So I guess I can stop with saying um, what dramaturgically I bring to the design dimension of what we're building here is the constant question about how best to frame the story. Sometimes, to use the examples Fitz just used, uh, the Living Theater article has a fairly extensive article. There are a lot of words with the pictures there. Um, the photo shoot 
that follows it in issue five with the On the Town Chorus Girls basically has photo credits, a little blurb, but it's primarily a photographic essay. And that kind of establishes the range of the kinds of pieces we do in chants and deciding how much words, how many words, how, what kind of context to provide the design to communicate to our audience is part of what I'm involved in. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I can only reiterate chance is a, is a real game changer in terms of how people are looking at design and particularly designers themselves are looking at design, which is exciting. But in terms of how design and dramaturgy interface, I, I think they're deeply, deeply, deeply interwoven. I mean, both in the, I, I always think of dr dramaturgy as sort of, you know, this great nebulous field, but in, in, the, in the corners of it that are deep about the pure research part of things, we do exactly the same thing. And the, uh, you know, we have to know the real worlds that the playwrights are talking about, but as storytellers, <laughs> we're completely interfaced. And I have, uh, often have very uh, tight relationships with the dramaturgs on the projects that I'm working on because we're both trying to figure out how to tell the story and particularly on new plays we're trying to figure out where the meat is and, and if we can't quite get to it you know what's the root of that question and always going back to the playwright to ask that question and what's the most important thing about what they're trying to say and I think so I think in that way we're deeply deeply interwoven as fields. <clears throat> uh, I'm just processing all this, and I certainly think it's worthwhile that we all engage this conversation about um, how we're all named within this field and find our various professions, because there's certainly, even within the, the world of design, uh, there's a lot of breakdown uh, in terms of <laughs> what we all do together collaboratively that, that uh, sometimes doesn't appear when we see all these titles. Um, but I, I <clears throat> I'm thinking about this question from the lens of, um, as an educator, so I've been teaching at Hunter College for 13 years, and um, I teach undergrads, and undergrads who are not necessarily in a professional track. And I feel like this question about dramaturgy really comes up for me as, a, as an educator, because to ask myself why learn set design, why learn, why be in a costume class if you're not necessarily, you know, in the training, um, is, is really a question of why we make theater. Why, 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 why do we need this play to happen? And I feel like it's a place that I begin, and it generally is a place of engaging a text or sometimes developing a text. But, um, and to me, that's, that's a dramaturgical impulse. I don't know if I have the right definitions, but I do feel like I'm teaching my students before I teach them to design. I'm teaching them to dramaturg in some way um, without necessarily <laughs> that training myself. And I often feel like I find myself using the term visual dramaturgy or some, somehow looking for language to kind of activate this dialogue that we as designers have with plays and texts, especially when we're not with directors. So in a, in a classroom environment, you're often, you know, there isn't a director there um, or a dramaturg. It's, you're often doing a project a student's doing a project on their own, and so it's this amazing opportunity to kind of say, you're everything, <laughs> and I'm gonna teach you how to do that as a means to get to this very specific practice. Um, and I guess I'm realizing in this conversation that I love that I have that opportunity because it, it, it allows me to feel that I don't have to necessarily s see all these boundaries. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I also just to, personally have uh, recently had the experience of kind of initiating a work and trying to ask myself how does a, a design um, kind of become a text in a way or become something that leads to further creation and I think in retrospect I wish we had had a, a kind of dramaturg on that project for the design <laughs> like I wish I had been collaborating with a dramaturg to say so exactly what are, in some ways, what are the kind of rules that you're setting up? And, and I think that leads me to think about where do designers and dramaturgs meet when it comes to audience and space and event? Like what, are, what is that? Um, I often feel like we meet around text, but generally I feel like as a set designer, what I'm bringing to the table is 
a real, real um, investment in the audience experience, which may, may or may not be directly related to the text. So I know that's a lot, but. <laughs> um, no, that's great. That's great. Uh, and um, yeah, and you may want to speak a little bit more about this too, Louisa, in the, in the, the, with the next question, because I, I wanted to um, just ask, uh, ask each of you if there's a particular project that comes to mind where that intersection um, between dramaturgy and design really became very potent for you. It, it might be the first time you, you really saw the connection or something recently that, that was revelatory for you or, um, or even discovering a conflict between the two is something that sometimes happens as well. And certainly for me, one of the attractions to this topic is um, as a new play dramaturg working closely with an on, uh, a company called Ghost River Theatre in Calgary, who uh, bring the design, uh, the design work, and they do a lot of new media and projection design uh, into their creative process as they're building a show. And so, um, my conversations in those rooms are very much with the uh, with the designer of the projections, the lighting designer, um, and increasingly with the set and costume designer as we build the, the the visual dramaturgy of the play and try to take away text where text is not needed because the the visual world of the play and the visual dramaturgy of the play is expressing it. Um, so I I is there a particular project that comes to mind where you felt like there's a really potent intersection or you learned something new about that intersection? I'm going to go a little bit sideways on this question. Go for it. And talk a little bit about my work at the O'Neill, um, which is basically, so I spent 10 summers at the O'Neill working on new plays that were in development, as they always say at the O'Neill, the play's not done when it gets there, and the play's not done when it leaves. Um, the day before they start, they have a seven-day rehearsal process with stellar directors and actors, and the day before they start, the playwright will sit on the farmhouse porch with myself and five other designers, the director is there, the dra dramaturg is there, but we ask the director not to speak and the dramaturg not to speak, and the, the designers speak directly to the playwright about the visual world of their play. Um, and it's always coming from a storytelling basis. So we're asking the designer, what do you think your world looks like? What, how does this play, how do you want this to really look when it, when it gets on its feet? And the first thing they always say is, oh, that's not my job, I don't know. And then we say, oh, all right, well, then let us tell you how we think it looks based on the text. And we say, I think it looks like this. And they're like, no, 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 it doesn't look like that. It looks like, and you start to pull out of them this incredible conversation that helps them visualize the world of their play. And this, you know, they will say, you will get to this point in the text and sometimes you'll say, uh, 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 I can't believe that you think that that is blue. Here's why I think it's red. I think it's red because of this and this and this that's in the text. So these, and then they sort of stop and they think about it. It's like taking something that a playwright knows intimately from this perspective and backing it up and spinning it around and showing them their own play, kind of from the back and the side, which is where de designers look at things. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a sort of huge step back. And it's, fu it's fascinating also to watch the directors who crawl out of their chairs wanting to speak, <laughs> not <laughs> being allowed to speak. But at the end of that hour, you know, they have, they have under, they, they sort of have taken something away from that conversation that they would never have because that conversation directly between designer and, and playwright without a filter and on something that's not going into production at this time, right? So that's the essential ingredient and why this conversation is possible. But that, that conversation is amazing. And then we let the directors talk and the whole conversation changes. But so, so as the week goes on, now they go into rehearsals and now, I, now there is a director, there is a proper dramaturg. <laughs> and so that the conversation is much freer for me than it has been before I started doing this job because I feel like I, I can go to the dramaturg much more easily and say, I'm worried about this story point I don't, you know, it would be completely inappropriate for me to go directly to the playwright as the eighth voice in the room and say, you know, but I can plant a seed with the director or with the dramaturg and say, hey, I, I worry that this part doesn't add up and from where I sit, I think it has to do with this seed back here. Um, so that whole sort of, that project, <laughs> that, that 10 year 80 play, 80 playwright project for me, it, it has completely changed how I, how I work on plays and how I, it, it's changed my ability to be articulate about story points and, and things like that and how they affect things. Um, Great. Martha, you had something. Uh, 
just two points to add. I want, I, so have you completed your arc? Did you end? Did. So I had the privilege last summer of watching Rachel. So first it's like a compliment to Rachel. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> when I was at the O'Neill as a part of the National Critics Institute, but watching uh, you do one of these exquisite um, dream design meetings. It was one of the best dramaturgical conversation I think I, I've ever heard. It was really beautiful. So um, she kind of embodies a blend, I guess. <laughs> so I did that was a compliment, two points I want to make of that compliment, and that was an exquisite thing, and I, and I hope somehow you're able to build that into every process you do, hello, somehow. Um, uh, and the other, it, it reaches back a little bit, but this point of my own personal experience of the, the blending, and I guess it's a little lesson of how we can do it more. I was working on a production um, of a fellow at Writers Theater in Chicago, in Glencoe. And uh, I developed all my period, I was the production dramaturg, all my materials separately, and had assembled them and shared them with the, the cast and the, and the um, uh, assembled uh, other designers with whom I had not been meeting up to that point. And the costume designer in particular came up to me afterwards and said, this would have been delightful to have. Um, two months ago, when before as I was beginning my own uh, exploration and development of materials. So it just underscored for me very early in my dramaturgical play and adventures uh, the need for early collaboration amongst all the pieces, because who knows what everyone else will need. Why replicate effort, but also the conversations can start very early. I did think of the, an answer to your question. <laughs> Go for Which it. Which is, um, many, many, many years ago, I worked on a production of Antony and Cleopatra in Los Angeles. My partner, Lisa Peterson, was directing it. She decided to adapt it to be performed by seven actors. Um, and we couldn't quite figure out how to do it. So the amazing Berkeley rep brought, back in the day when this was possible, everybody to Los Angeles so that we could have a conference. And it was Lisa uh, who was doing the adaptation, all four of the designers, the dramaturg, the voice and text coach. And we sat, and somebody else, and we sat in our living room and read through all the parts. I played Caesar, thank you. Um, <laughs> and in the room was the um, very young, very brilliant Annie Wiseman, who is now a playwright and a screenwriter. Um, and Annie, as the dramaturg, we talked and talked and talked and talked about this play. And, we, and it's somewhere in the middle of the third day of this, um, we were talking about the, the difference between the um, cultures of Egypt and Rome and how they function differently within the course of the play. And Annie said this brilliant, sh brilliant, brilliant thing, which was that it's like, because, the, because of where they are in their histories, it's like Egypt is functioning on an arc of space and Rome is functioning on an arc of time. And that concept defined everything in the production. It absolutely defined how the world looks, it was, a, it, was a, it was like the moment where all of these ideas just dropped into place. And that opportunity is exactly what you're saying. It happened before any design, it happened before the script was final, it happened before any design work had been done. It was, an ama it was a fantastic opportunity. Great. Uh, Louisa Fitz? Well, I guess I, I would just, you know, as you know, it is possible to design in theater without having that awesome experience. The, 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 the problem, I think, for designer becomes if you're not plugged into something as great as that, it becomes difficult to sort of age into theater. I don't know how to describe it, but as you spend more time in theater, you need more from it. And since theater is more than willing to allow designers to operate on the periphery as uh, people that plug in very late in the game and sort of... Uh, you know, um, perform their kind of, I, I don't know how to describe it. You, you, you go, you know, on your 300th production, you just go into your thing, you rock out your groove, you get through it, it's great, and then you move on. Part of it's the dynamics of, of the way we earn money and we survive and all this business. But at some point, you can really hit a wall where that's not gonna work for you anymore. And what I love hearing, um, about what Rachel's talking about. It's, it, that's a great room of people because all of those people have hit that moment where they really can't do theater without deeper conversations. And I, I, and I think, you know, when I was coming here today trying to resolve the question, well, I don't want get to get ahead, but I do want to say that I think we all know that 
uh, designers and dramaturgs are not typically put in really strong conversational process-driven environments uh, where they can um, uh, kind of unify, I guess, or come together or go into process together without outcomes being immediately foregrounded. And um, I do think that what the magazine is trying to do, almost like the movie Inception, it, it needs to kind of, it actually forces new kinds of processes into the conversation in the theater. Uh, I think at some point we were gonna have to talk about the diff how text is sensualized and, and why the sensuality of looking at things, the process of looking and the excavation of the poetic center from objects, from color and from space are such an important aspect of design and, and how that can relate to text. It's, it's very germane to the project of the magazine, but I thought I'd mention it now. Yeah, that's great. And I do want to come back to the, the idea of, of the process, the creation process, and, and where dramaturgs and designers sit in it. Louisa, did you have an, an example of a, of a project you wanted to talk about? Um, well, I'm just I'm kind of thinking, I, the, the, when I think about the, the moments of as a designer where I feel like I'm in a, a kind of a, a deep dramaturgic role kind of search, but you know, on, beside the kind of wealth of research or getting to know a text, I, it often comes up on um, doing site-specific work. And I'm trying to, I'm sitting here trying to figure out why the projects that I'm thinking about in the context of this are all site-specific. And I think it's because um, there's something very game-changing about trying to do a piece of theater um, outside of a context that's malleable. I mean, not that theaters are all completely um, fluid, but that there's something, a site tends to kind of um, often bring something of its own uh, character or so often certain kinds of limitations. And I think you end up in this conversation that, that often I find really a, a very dramaturgical place as a designer, if that makes sense. And I was thinking about a production I did with Soho Rep of David Ajmi's Elective Affinities, which is a short piece, um, a monologue, really, and of a woman in an Upper East Side apartment. And we were able to stage this in an actual townhouse on the Upper East Side. And um, th there was a lot of <coughs> complexities to trying to figure out how, how we would find ourselves and how an audience would then find themselves in this room with this woman. But in the text, and this is, I don't know, this is what just kind of perked up in here, uh, there's a, a sculpture. The woman has just commissioned a sculpture. And to this day, um, the question of do we see the sculpture is like, I'm, I feel like I'm still living that horror <laughs> as a designer. <laughs> I feel like I'm still like, I don't know if we should have seen it. And, <laughs> but, we, but we did choose to represent this, this kind of imaginary work that was that was in the in the uh, conversation of this character and um, I, I, I I don't honestly remember all the kind of I mean there was a million conversations about this but uh, for whatever reason it really perks up for me as a place of like it has something to do with reality like do we do we what is what is real what is an imagination what what um, when something is real in a text does it really have to exist on state. I mean, that, that line there for me is like, as a, as a it's, it goes, it's, it's, we all share it, but it's somehow a, a very um, complex one in terms of some kind of rules or something that I'm always looking to others to kind of, and I think Fitz is right, that the, the, the deeper you get into making this type of work, sometimes you lose that vantage point. And that's to me where I feel like I'm most heavily kind of engaged dramaturgs, it's like, please, <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> and so, I, I, I want to, that, that's, I mean, she's just said it, and, and it's, it's this whole thing. <clears throat> I mean, I started teaching reader response theory in my sound design class because it, it seemed like such a great place where this question of what, to what degree is any text is being completed or written in the mind of the viewer. And then, in the same sense, What's, where, where does design fit in that? And uh, it, it, was, it was even, th this was taken to new heights when I designed a, a stage reading of the Rose Tattoo with Patti LuPone and, 
and Bobby Cannavale on the set of Airline Highway. And, uh, you know, 12 hours or whatever, and six, 700 people came in. And I sat in the back of the theater, uh, and I saw everything. I mean, the, it, was it was an incredible experience. I, w I saw her bedroom. I saw the coastline. I saw the town. I saw the road. I saw, I, I was really, I was unaware that there wasn't a set. And, and it, it just took it to even a greater space for me. I just recently designed a, a sh uh, Anna Nightingale sing in, in Berkeley Square, and at some point near the end, at, when it's VE Day, and they're on the porch looking out, and they t they describe you know what they're seeing, and I didn't design in things that had sound because it was just very clear to me that in listening to them, everyone would hear them anyway, and um, so I don't know if anyone else wants to talk about it because but this truly, if you want to know, as I was coming over to what is the most you the most actionable. <laughs> thing of asking the question about the relationship between a, dr a dramaturg and a designer is what not to build, what not to make, what not to realize. And uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that. Uh, yeah, yeah, go for it. Does that, does that, what does that inspire in you? It, it's, it, it's the, I think it's the root of all design, yeah. honestly, that question of what do you, you know, when, when a, uh, I mean, it goes right back to Shakespeare, right? He tells you everything because they couldn't show you any of it, right? So that, that lesson is everywhere. And when you have a text that tells you, that tells you where you are, then the, 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 the completely unique rules of theater, which don't apply in the other, in the other visual storytelling worlds, you know, in, in, in television and, and in film, I can tell you that a log is a motorcycle. I can tell you that a log is a couch. I can tell you that a log is a log, right? And you'll come with me. We set up the rules, and you as an audience member will come with me. So that opportunity of what do you show, what do you not show, what will, if I, I cannot tell you, I'm a very abstract thinker. I often, my designs are, are, are pretty abstract. There's a, I am a massive user of negative space. Um, and, and allowing the, I, I'm asking the audience to come with me. I'm asking the audience to invest in the space and to do exactly what Fitz is talking about and put themselves on that stage with it. I cannot tell you how many times people have come up to me and said, it is amazing how you planted that subliminal imagery about Christ on stage. And I'm like, <laughs> that's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's amazing what people will, will bring to the story if you give them this, this space and ask them to actively step into those worlds. And I think that that's, that's what you're talking about there, which is great. Martha? Well, I'd just like to add, you know, dramaturgs like to quote things, but as you're speaking, um, that what came to mind were two quotes from two of the folks we featured as mo in our monographs in, in Chance. And the first one, Ben Edwards, a designer from for most of the 20th century, that designer said, was quoted um, in an interview in 1994, I don't believe in reality in the theater, it's the illusion of reality I believe in. I believe in tremendous elimination, which just kind of resonated over and over for me. Um, and in a kind of larger elimination kind of choice, um, Boris Aronson, uh, reflecting on his own career, said, they asked me once, what's your greatest achievement in the theater? And I said, the shows I refuse to do. So I, I guess that's a more, more <laughs> <laughs> really very selective. But anyway, I just wanted to throw that in to animate yeah. the conversation. <laughs> and it's interesting that the, because we're using some beautiful words and, and, and in the magazine and, and certainly you know in our work we, we see some beautiful images um, and uh, even the images that aren't there <laughs> um, in our own minds and I, I'm curious about the relationship between the imagery um, the beautiful imagery that you use in the magazine and, and the, the way that you write about the work and, and what that relationship is and, and how, how, it in, how they inform each other so do you guys want to talk a little bit about that and the relationship between imagery and text and chance sure I, I think the first thing is, and I, and I know we understand this, the photographer is an artist, so, and we know that, that images aren't real, the, the, what's inside the image space is not a direct transmission of, um, of the, s the proposed subject. So I think what we did to break down the question of how you activate photography, and, and the reason photography is so deactivated in a nutshell, is that, and forgive me, well, you know, I don't want to be too broad about it, but there's a process by which photographs are made in theater 
that by and large emphasizes the neutrality or of the photographer or to a very great degree deactivates them as a creative artist. If you think of, say, the work of Gregory Crudson, what he does with space and then what a, a typical shoot from a, a show, you know, and you get at it because what you notice is all of the, so many of the shoots of the shows, if you look at eight or nine in a row, they start looking uh, like they're the same show. So. The, 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 the importance of the, the way, it, the, what, we, what we asked was how can we turn photography on for theater? And it had to do with placing artistic agency in the photographer, creating ideal conditions under which they could take, uh, un undertake a shoot and giving them the time to execute it. But more importantly, it was this question of the medium of transmission being paper. And it was, it's just very clear that you cannot stand in row J and take a picture of the proscenium frame with stuff in it and have the image work. And, and it, the reason in part it doesn't work is that it's not so much that it doesn't work on its own. It doesn't, it starts to not work in the context of the flow of not just images within that production, but all of the other production images. It sort of gets washed into this space. So the, the it real, what it comes down to is this, and this is, you know, it's just a little indefinite, but there is resonating inside the visual space of a production and the objects that are made for the production and the light, et cetera, a kind of poetic center. And the question is, how can you transmit that in the medium of print so that the viewer has a, a, an, an affected poetic experience in the way they relate to the images that they're looking at. There's a kind of seduction to them, there's a sensuality to them, and you'll find that the photos that we do of productions are very clearly, we strip away a lot of things, we take actors out of the environment, we uh, do a lot of things, we never shoot shows that are just actually being performed, we break it down into smaller pieces, create ideal circumstances for the photographers create a vision to be activated. But then what you get in the course of, and the shoots run long, so they have an immersive quality to them. You kind of have to go, you'll go through 30 images or whatever to, and the idea is not so much, are you seeing a document of the show, but in the arc of this, of this editorial, do you undergo, have some kind of poetic experience that actually resonates with the production as if you were there? So the conceit is not that it's a one-to-one -one transmission or that the photographer is documenting and trying to give it to you again. The only way the photographer is gonna give you an experience of that show is if he's going to move you aesthetically in, in the way you experience the immersiveness of the visual space. It's the same thing that we do when we make plays. And so it, theater then becomes the subject of the photographer but then the photographer undertakes to make something actually totally different out of the subject. And then hopefully, when the text is, when we add the text and other, yeah, the then hopefully when all that is brought together, you somehow get back to the play, but the photos aren't by themselves don't necessarily do that. Well, and sometimes, I mean, you're talking about the, the, the balance of image to text. This is a photography magazine where sometimes the text, the, the words are dominant, but there always has to be a visual interest. And here's an example, and it's in the most recent, and it, that can sometimes challenge us till we figure it out. Um, we've had it, we've had in our, in our, um, I don't know, lined up, ready to roll, uh, for about a year and a half, a really fascinating conversation between playwrights Shar White and John Logan. And we'd edited it, it was ready, but we hadn't, couldn't quite figure out how to visually present that. It's a very text, it's a conversation. So it's not, we're not talking about any one particular production, although they talk about many, and some of them, they're talking about um, images in movies that Logan had written. Um, but it's just a conversation between two artists talking about their craft. So we, it took us a while to figure out how to crack, how to, how to illustrate it. And if there are any issue fives around the table, you'll see how we cracked it. It was through, a graphic designer, um, illustrator, uh, w who figured out some um, caricatures and beautiful imagery, and Shar White actually went back in and annotated his own commentary with a commenting on himself. Yeah, I don't know, um, in a very humorous way. 
in the margin, a very funny, he's a very funny guy. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation where we're trying to figure out what the balance is between text and images and sometimes going to humor and sometimes going to, we're trying to figure out whole new strategies. Ah, so here's, again, another delay. Um, uh, but we haven't had a monograph for a couple of issues, and it's not for lack of trying. We're actively developing, which is all, uh, with any publication, we have many, many things in development. When, when we look at the time it's time to publish, you know, which ones are ready to roll. Um, and we've uh, been working with um, Alice Regan, who's written a beautiful monograph about um, Maria uh, Irene uh, Fornes, um, a beautiful monograph, our challenge being how to illustrate it. Um, she, yeah, I don't know, famously, there isn't a huge archive of her stuff. We found several sources of folks who worked with her quite um, closely of their own personal photographs and set models and things. Uh, and th th we had a set of okay photographs that Fitz took of these ephemera, these pieces of ephemera, but then we're now waiting for, and you can tell, like we're still waiting, it'll be the next issue before it goes out because of this new source. Yeah. So in the process of doing the monograph and going out and looking for stuff, because if the thing is you say, well, we can't, we're not gonna publish this awesome writing, which it's great, unless we can find images that, that meet it or exceed it, We've, we discovered that, that the, the, um, the theater photographer for the Village Voice for about 20 years, uh, her name is Sylvia Placci, and she shot downtown theater for, from the 70s to the 90s for them, and her entire archive is in the basement of her house in Queens. So you can imagine. That's a theme now, basement archives. So <laughs> it, is a, it, is a, it is a thing, and we go to John, you know, we go to uh, Donald Eastman and his original models for Irene are on a shelf in his house. So we, we, we called Doug Reside while I wrote him, and I said, w this could be amazing. And he wrote a letter in support saying that the, the library, the Billy Rose Collection, would be willing to invest resources and time in cleaning, preparing, and organizing Sylvia's archive to be included in the library. So it's gonna be, when it's done, we're gonna have hundreds of shows and hundreds of images of these shows that have never been seen before. Because these shoots undertaken for The Voice, they might have run one or two. Sylvia shot the whole thing from top to bottom. That'll be all of, Mar all of, the, all of Maria's plays, all of these other great plays, and it's, they're just sitting there. So I talked to Sylvia, and she's really not excited about having to do all this work. It's a tedious, but the library is gonna, are gonna give her the resources to do it. And then when they digitize it, it's on the web, it's gonna be an incredible resource. So this is the thing that's going on. The monograph thing is you find someone who's still living that was involved and then they lead to and they lead to and they lead to and they all have stuff. And it's just, it's really great. So there's a big excavation and also reclamation yes. process that's coming from it that is incredibly gratifying as you can imagine. That's more than that's exciting, and I think what that brings to mind one of the one of the things that occurs to me, which is that um, because we don't often have a chance to be in dialogue with each other until later in the process, dramaturgs and designers, um, I'm curious about you know, and, and chance is a wonderful opportunity for um, dramaturgs to sort of immerse themselves in design. And I know you guys just came back from the Prague Quadrennial, which is another great immersive experience. I have a bunch of friends, the uh, Canadian. Um, exhibition was created in Calgary, so a bunch of my friends. Oh, great! I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, so that's another opportunity for to Im immerse yourself in 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 the design world and the ideas around the world that are happening in design. Um, what would your what places what recommendations would you have? Um, and I'm, I'm looking to the designers uh, for sources or places or, or questions to begin with. In if a dramaturg wants to learn more about design or the design process. Um, wh what would you recommend? How do we how do we start that conversation? <laughs> I mean, the whole world of art and design <laughs> that's out there. The whole world of art and design. Where do we start? <laughs> I mean, uh, um, I, mean I, I, I don't. Uh, I feel like um, I, I don't know. I feel a kind of sense of that we ghettoize ourselves if we're only looking at theater mm -hmm. or kind of common sources for for inspiration in the theater. I mean, I think 
think to me this is a conversation that I'm still looking for of, of there's an, an incredible world of performative work being made kind of via the art world that, that we somehow theatrically are not always engaging in the same kind of terms. I'm, I think that work is powerful and interesting and, and certainly just spending time in museums and the, I mean we're, we're in a great resource island. <laughs> um, I mean, I had something I wanted to say about the other thing, but maybe we could add to the Yeah, okay. I, um, I just, to going back to what these guys were talking about, um, in a past, one of the past issues of Chance, there's a there's an article um, but that you guys did about a display designer, and I'm just forgetting his oh, name. Simon Dean. Simon Dean. Okay, so that, that article, that, that um, interview was really, I found it so interesting, because one of the things he says is like, He's kind of, you know, he's, he's, he's a master of designing display. So he did Barney's windows and he did, and you know, this is something that all of us, I think, in the theater kind of teeter on at times. Like, to what degree are we designing kind of a spectacle or something to be seen, right? Um, and he says this thing about immersive, because we've been kind of, this word keeps coming up, immersive. He says this thing about, you know, I don't get all this immersive. Everybody's such a narcissist right now. Why do we, why does everybody need to be in it? Why can't you just sit back and like enjoy the fact that somebody else does something really well, like a dancer? And, and I just love that was really powerful for me as somebody who's you know been exploring immersive work. Um, and I I think that's and I, as you guys were talking about the role of photography and chance and I, and I think this has something to do with dramaturgy. Um, I I I think this idea of distance of actually being an audience, like an active audience, where you really are outside the work. And you look at this amazing thing that somebody, I mean, that's what's happening to me as a designer in Chance, is I really feel, you know, yes, it pulls you in, but that's not, that, to me, that's not immersive. I'm really, I am looking at this view or this presentation in a way that somebody else has created um, exquisitely, and to appreciate that is some kind of entry point. And I really, I really, as a designer, that was a, that's connecting to that article, it's been really powerful to me of like, it's okay to let people kind of have an entry point and be distanced and then be brought in and as ver versus like having to necessarily be in the work. <laughs> and not that I'm anti, I mean, I'm so intrigued by immersive theater and I love it, but I, I, I thought that was really, some, it says something to me. So anyway, I wanted to share that. Yeah, and the, the concept of entry points I think is what, what is valuable yeah, in the, yeah. Distancing, I mean, it, it goes yeah. back to, you know, all sorts of epistemiatics on visual, things and how visual visuals speak to us as viewers and the language of that I think is is, is something that we don't often take stock in especially because we're so entrenched in a visual culture that we don't understand that we're, we're reading things visually all the time and we're acting on all the time and at what point are we aware enough of our distance as viewers to then be proactive about our viewing and I think that that's what I'm interested in in the magazine is somehow the, the the, pho the photographs and the text are, are putting things a little bit back on you, and I think it's a very empowering experience. I have to add, and this is going to be the double parenthesis, it's very, what she said is, is so in right on it, is what is the difference between looking and seeing, you know, if you ask yourself? And we are, we are in a culture right now where we look and we read images and we parse them, we scan them for data, but we're not seeing them. And seeing is a moment where you establish an interpretive aesthetic uh, experience of a, of a moment of an image. And the great impatience that vibrates under this magazine comes directly out of a culture that has basically received uh, a tidal wave of images that are compressed so they can be served on the web. That is to say, the, medium, the means of transmission is actually affecting content by subtracting so much color and so much actual sensual data. Then you ask, is, is a computer screen an ideal transmission medium for photography when it is compressed? It's a very good question whether or not that screen is actually a great space for doing that and how much do you enjoy reading you know it's the screen is another thing but this thing of when a culture undergoes 10 years of of 
looking and reading images and very little time anymore to see and experience them and have this one-on-one -on -one personal space with them. There's, I think, a great hollowing out. And I think, I don't know about you guys, but I have feel this great irritation and, and, and unhappiness with the internet right now. It was great for a while, and I got it into my muscle memory, and I was so, I had this thing, and then over time, less and less and less and less and less, and then, and then there was this thing, and it came from this feeling of almost like, I, it, you know how you drink coffee at a certain point and then it doesn't affect you anymore? It was a little bit like that. I couldn't have any more of it and get any more out of it. It wouldn't, it's not something at the very core of it is not, doesn't, is not made to deliver anymore. And I don't know, I, I have many thoughts about what it is. And this, but this thing of what she's talking about, the difference between reading and seeing an image is so to the heart of why we've undertaken this, this thing. But it goes to deep, a deeper hollowing out of our culture and this loss of the frame, the ability to stabilize the frame of a conversation around a subject, hold the frame, hold the attention, and to go deeper, this thing of clicking through da -da -da -da, web things, flipping around and all of this, it's really, I mean, it infantilizes your ability to, my daughter's attention span is on certain days is longer than mine. That's a very frustrating and uh, humbling position to be in. And it's, I've, I'm so, the magazine is about excav excavating ourselves as visual people out of this kind of desiccated, flow where images great and images weak ultimately have the same power. Do you know what I mean? I, I, uh, I want to talk about two things. I want to respond to your question, which okay, was a sure. while ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to say one thing about Chance. When, when, right when they were starting this magazine, we were te Fitz and I were in tech and we were working on a really unusual project downtown at the Atlantic and he got interested in the design. It was the first issue and he wanted to feature the design for Harper Regan. And it was, he shot a test shot of the set. He was trying to figure out how to, t how to capture the, the design. And then Sandy happened, and we were not able to do the actual shoot of the design. Um, and so he asked me to write instead for the magazine. But he ran the one picture that he took. And as the designer of that set, what he showed me about my own design in that photograph was remarkable. And it was, in a sense, because he took the design seriously. And he talked when he were, we were just, they were just starting to think about, uh, as a, a group of designers, what this magazine wanted to be. It was about taking the visual world of the play seriously and shooting it at the level of fashion photography, as opposed to shooting it as the backdrop to the actors. Does, do you understand the difference in the, in the, and you can see it in the, quality of the print and the images themselves. But that moment was amazing. And then he said, okay, well, will you write for it instead? Which was amazing experience for me. Um, that aside, when you, and thank you for that, by the way. Um, when, you know, when you're talking about how, how do you, as dramaturgs, step into the world of design, which was kind of the root of that question a while ago, sort of, um, I would say two things. I would ask you to remember something that I tell my students to remember when I'm lucky enough to be teaching, which is, when a playwright writes a, a, even a very specific stage direction or description into a text, there are hundreds of ways to honor that description and put that design on stage. So when you walk into a theater or when, you know, in, in as many oftentimes happens, I don't get time with the dramaturg until first rehearsal. So my, my choices have been made by then. They have to be made and in fact the set is generally half built by then. So, you know, this thing of, oh gosh, it would have been so great to have that information, you know, when we were thinking, when we were really thinking about this, that's a real root of this, you know. Um, and I would say, there's a couple of things I could quickly cite to say if you wanted to just, you know, crack your mind open about the world of design. There's a couple of different things you could do, and one is to look at the website for the Prague Quadrennial, because you think how, you know how stories are told visually, right? No. <laughs> look at how the Germans do it, look at how they do it in Eastern Europe, look at how they do it in Japan. 
completely different, and these are all the same stories. And you can take the plays that have traveled the world and look at the same designs in different cultures for how these plays have been done. Um, and I would cite, only because I'm so close to this project, but I would cite a project called An Iliad, which is a one-man adaptation of the storytelling of the Iliad. Um, and it, it, it cites, I don't think there's any description. A guy walks into a room, the story starts, right? Like, that's it. Um, and the, you know, this play has tapped into something, and it's being done everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And it is amazing to watch um, the different ways this has been, it, 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 the way it manifests on stage. It's completely, completely, completely different. And there's also a whole other corner of this, which is I worked on the original production. We now travel with it. We take it three suitcases. We go wherever we can. We just got back from Cairo, which is amazing. And we make up the set when we get there, but we carry the sound design and the lighting design because our interpretation of this text, and this is Lisa uh, did the adaptation with Dennis O'Hare, and it is their production. So the way that, that we interpret it, we need very few things, but the space itself. And so the heart of that storytelling is then the lighting and the sound and the stuff that I can find when I get there, which P.S. gets me the plane ticket to Cairo, which I'm up for. But it's amazing to when you go to different cultures and bring this kind of storytelling, to watch the people in Cairo who do not have this tradition of storytelling, watch a story that has that sort of design, that's the Prague Quadrennial flipped on its heels for me because it's the opportunity to watch these guys, you know, the technicians never stick around for the rehearsal or the performances, ever. The guys who installed that show for us in Cairo watched the dress rehearsal and both performances. They were there every night because they were so fascinated by how different it was than how they would have told this same story. So, I mean, I just think that sense of, you know, don't, just don't accept the design as, you know, it is the, it is the product of a thousand small choices. So, you know, when you see it on that first day, the, as the designer, when you bring the design of a world premiere to the playwright, and it's this little tiny box, and you bring it to them for the first time, you've had this initial conversation and a series of research and a whole, you know, moments at the very beginning when you start this play with the playwright, and then they go away for a while, and a couple weeks later, you're, you have a done thing, and you show it to the playwright, and there's a really sort of very nervous moment where you say, is this your play? It, you know, and they can say no. <laughs> so it's a very, that give and take is a really essential, essential, essential part of the conversation. Before we open it up to the audience, Martha, wh what would you recommend? What, what, what entry points have you had or would you recommend to people? Um, in, into design? Yeah, into design or into the conversation about design. You know, m I think my perspective has been perverted in a delightful way by this experience that I've had over the last three years of swimming constantly, daily, with this character and the other primarily designers who are involved. There are other writers that we bring in and some other writers in the core team, but primarily designers. So I'm, I'm constantly um, learning, I mean, we're, lear we're sharing, we're learning to, we're building a joint vocabulary continually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how to talk, talk about and think about our excitement about a particular piece. Um, so I guess my entry point is every day, and it's with this group of people that are primarily designers that I, who I've fallen in love with the way they think. That's great. So, um, we have about uh, we have about 20 minutes, 25 minutes for some questions, and Emma's going to bring around a mic. Um, I see uh, Shelley, and then we'll go back there. Vicki was saying, please do use the mic. So, um, so thank you so much both for sharing the magazine with us in this way and, and the very generous um, offer to, to send it to us. I'm very excited. I'm going to go home and watch the mailbox. Um, and thank you all for your thoughts. Um, I have a very self-interested question that I hope all will be interested in. Um, I'm Shelley Orr. I teach at SDSU, San Diego State University. We have a very strong design program that is um, in many ways trying to fashion and refashion itself as a design for an MFA in design for theater, television, and film. So a very active sort of development of all those areas. Um, one of my concerns, though, is that the wonderful faculty in that school, or in that part of our school, um, are looking to 
in my mind and from my view, curtail some of the conversation you were talking about where oftentimes we don't get to speak as dramaturgs and designers in those non-pressured situations except in the classroom, right? Those are the conversations and actually one of the things that I have um, had the opportunity to do is to mentor and chair, I'm um, chair, sit on committees for MFA design thesis just because they've had class with me kind of, you know, they know that I'm a person, I'm a thinking person, I'm like that second or third person on the committee. Um, but unfortunately the design sort of curriculum is getting so full, we have to have AutoCAD, we have to have this, we have to have that, we have to have engineering classes, we have to, that they want to take away the theater history component of the MFA, which is making me a little scared and nervous. And so if you can just give me some talking points so that I can approach my very dear colleagues and say, please don't phase that out. Well, it's a, just, I'll keep this brief, but it's that, that is is directly a result of the the early over professionalization of theater <laughs> and this is in a risk managed theater economy and we have to remember that theater in america is 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 also a transaction and so this blurry role about who's first in new york is very clear the producer is the star <laughs> and then we're all working with or for the producer, certainly in Broadway, the producer has a very strong role in, in deciding which designers are going to come to the table, et cetera. But what I would just say is, students, in my opinion, are, 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 are um, professionalized into the established production process of theater so early, and therefore they have to go through all of these things that are essentially outcome-driven skill acquisition things, that there, the whole question about whether or not they're going to have an intellectual process that gets at the heart of why we do it, and I'll tell you the reason I think it is, is I think it has to do with theater is incredibly dangerous when people are actually doing what they want, when they're coming from their gut about stuff, when they're coming, when they're working as problem solvers, theater becomes a much more manageable beast. And I think theater has obviously the, the, the power to be incredibly disruptive and transgressive, but in a highly professionalized transaction economy, it's a little bit more fluffy and easy to wrangle. And so I think the tragedy or the, the, what's so disturbing about what you're talking about is that in the effort of this program to produce m monetizable outcomes and careers, they're teaching very young people very early not, they're, well, they're not, let's just say they're not inviting their discomfort. They're not inviting their revolutionary spirit. They're not inviting any questions maybe about why theater is helping making them more psychologically healthy, why they need it, you know? Why theater as, as a form of transgression is actually uh, a very healthy, place for theater to be. Uh, they must have that training. They must have it. They must have the theater history. They must know about storytelling. They must know about the roots of this. They must be able to draw on the roots of this. If they don't have the skill of storytellers and, uh, and the intellectual uh, thinking that comes behind all of that training, what in the world are they going to do with their technical skills? I mean, they have to, they, those skills are also important. Don't get me wrong. But they must, they must not let go of the theater history. Yeah. We, have, yeah, we have a question back here, and then we'll go to you, Mark. Hi, my name's Jess Applebaum. I'm so excited by this panel today. Um, and I wanted to offer like one entrance also into dramaturgs working with designers. A design meeting happens every year, and it's like a kid in a candy store. I go, it was at Fordham a few years ago, I don't know if it's always housed there, but you can go around and you have set designers and you have costumers and, and sound, I think, is sound there? I mean, that's the question that I want to raise today, but, but you can just go and start conversations and I've had tremendous relationships from saying I am interested in your design and I have collaborators now because I've initiated that dialogue and it's, so I just wanted to offer that and for dramaturgs also, I think John Berger's way of, the, the way of seeing is like another great source, but so um, I don't really care about award shows, but I think that what the Tonys did was offer up an opportunity for us to talk about sound design and 
Um, and I wanted to raise that as um, a question is, as dramaturgs and designers, how can we work together to kind of illuminate uh, a really important factor in performance? Um, and I, I just see this as an opportunity for us to, again, kind of push into what performance is. And so, yeah, sound design, how, how can we work with each other to um, have its foundation be understood or recognized by others? I'll maybe pass this over to the sound designer. It's really, it's, it's ironic. Now, I'm, I'll just offer that the medium of transmission of the magazine is paper and it is silent. it's silent. Uh, no sound is, we, no one in this room has ever heard a sound that was not commingled with space. So, sp space is, is where sound occurs. But this thing about how to activate it on the page is something that we're constantly uh, meditating on. I shot an interesting installation project. Um, now, it, in, at the PQ, it seems that getting at sound in chance gets easier when the spaces become less conventional. And in part because some of the sound sources move from being speakers to being things with microphones in them, objects that can be seen where the inferential outcome of that object as a sound making thing is just so clear in the image. Yeah. So um, I, I, I think it, the difficulty of getting a sound in print first it immediately is cl clear in the sense that it can't be seen, but uh, it gets easier when the spaces become less traditional. You know me, I always have something to say. I mean, <laughs> um, I think, you know, again, another thing that I find completely outrageous is that a bunch of theater professionals feel like they're not qualified to, de to un determine sound design, the, the level of the gift of sound. I find it unbelievable. Um, and, you know, um, I, you know, in terms of like, how do you facilitate that conversation? We're fighting it every day. We're, you know, I mean, there's a very active, active, active group online that is trying to get people to understand what sound design is because you can't touch it, you can't put it in writing, you can't. But when you, you know, there are four essential designers to every play. They are equal in their storytelling, essential nature. And sound is absolutely on equal terms with that. And what, how you shape a story through how a room, a space, you know, sounds, feels, I mean, just this room in itself, you know, the quality of the sound in this room, for example. <laughs> yes. You know, I mean, there's a certain amount of technical skill in just literally making the text audible and controlled, but that's not really what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the way the environment of sound and the bed of sound holds and furthers a story. And how, how do you educate people on that? That is a great question. It's beyond me that people whose, whose world is telling stories don't understand it themselves, I, I, I'm at a loss. What's the answer? <laughs> well, I, have, I have one more word. I'm, I'm like, I oh, completely feel the same way. A, a couple words to say about um, uh, the sound design. W uh, when that um, heinous decision came down last year, uh, Fitz, uh, Fitz engaged in a conversation with a woman from 829, Cecilia, um, it, 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 that was published in HowlRound. Hello, HowlRound. Um, that Yes, uh, so uh, uh, and, uh, in the moment, within days of the decision, a fairly in-depth conversation about how that could have happened, just the mechanics of the decision, you know, who was in the room and what um, wh was up. Um, and this, this challenge, for Chance in particular, but you know, uh, th this challenge of how to con engage with, think about, represent, um, um, annotate, you know, document, uh, sound design as a co-equal uh, part of the design landscape is an ongoing challenge for us and we're playing with different ideas for how to do it. And, yeah. and, and I'll say about that, what Cecilia's conversation, this is not about design, but it's ish. <laughs> Cecilia's conversation revealed that there are fabrics of political relationships in which the union and the Broadway League are interwoven and therefore the union has to be careful because of uh, the following five reasons. And so effectively, the union did not respond. 
and they have not been held accountable yet. <laughs> but it has to do with their, all of these professional organizations ultimately are, are interconnected. And so there's just been this, um, uh, you know, reticence to truly get involved because they're all friends, and we're all friends. And, and uh, but th that, that award is problematic on so many levels, it being a kind of crowdsourced award with no training and no way to really verify whether or not everyone's seen every show and all the other uh, issues. Martha is, uh, was Drama Desk, uh, not, you know, nominated for, for two years, and they have an extremely rigorous process where they find sound not to be challenging in the least, so. Um. Take it seriously. Uh, Mark had something, and then I see you over there. Hi, I'm Mark Bly. I'm the dramaturg at the acting company. I wanted to follow up on a comment that uh, Fitz made and also a comment that Rachel made. Uh, Fitz, you, you talked about uh, the uh, impatience uh, with the media. And one of the, one of the great things about this, uh, about chance, uh, and I've read about three or four issues of it uh, and poured over it, and uh, I think it's a, an extraordinary magazine, and it's going to be a great training tool for people in universities and, and at large. Uh, is that you dare to not worry. You don't fret about being current. You don't, you don't worry about that. Uh, I was so surprised to encounter uh, articles, interviews, about something that happened 10 years ago, for God's sakes. You know, you didn't worry about that, uh, about currency, immediacy. And, and that was refreshing. And uh, I got excited about that. And, and that's grand, that's great. Uh, and second, and something that, that Rachel was talking about that I think is so much at the heart of, uh, of where we live, the, the, the strasse we live on as dramaturgs, if you will. And that's the notion of uh, if we're great, if we're meaningful, uh, and it's all artists ultimately, you know, designers, directors, everybody. Uh, we, we, the, 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 you talked about your experience at the O'Neill. A great designer knows something about directing, knows something about text, knows something about all aspects. And I believe great dramaturgs do too. They know something a little bit about directing, a little bit about design. I hope the hell something about text, you know. But all of that. And there was this amazing uh, evolutionary biologist at Harvard who died a number of years ago, Stephen Jay Gould, who talked about the notion that we you know, should celebrate our redundancy, that we all should bristle with multiple possibilities and not just be in this narrow little professional niche. And this magazine you know, celebrates that that we should bristle with multiple possibilities. There's one uh, episode, I think it's the Ming Cho Lee one. Oh my God, the man who bristles with multiple possibilities. It's fantastic. So great magazine, you should subscribe, that, that, you should that was subscribe. The first that was the first monograph where we were able to actually talk to the person who was the subject of the monograph. Uh, does it, yeah, does anyone want to respond to that before we move on to yeah, the next question? I do. I want to say that thing that you're saying about everybody has to have all of these, should have all of these fields in them and should feel free to speak about all of them. That's the nature of the collaboration. It's deeply, deeply collaborative field. And I can't tell you how many times when I've been in a meeting when the best visual idea has come from the sound designer. The composer was the guy who was like, you I, because they're all, we're all telling the same story and we're telling it together. And in the same way that like, I, 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 I have to step into those characters in order to figure out what their world looks like. And the costume designer has to completely intimately know those characters in order to do their work. So, you know, but this stuff is all very, very, very fluid and I have to be able to understand, we all do, what, what the director is going to need in terms of opportunity and you know, know that they will do that job far better than I could ever imagine doing that job, but 
I have to have a, a sense of how it works and what they might need. But this thing, the give and take of all of these things, it's, it's equal between all of us, and we need you guys. We want your perspective to be a part of it, and, and don't ever think otherwise. That's great. And I, I, just wanna, I just feel like there's a, there's a great argument in all of that's being said right now for the, the, the importance of designers being trained in a program that embraces a real kind of in-depth look at our history because um, this, this idea of repeating ourselves or not being afraid of redundancy, I mean, really has to do with conventions and traditions that, that um, I, I mean, I, I just recently had to teach like intro to theater and there were ways in which I kind of, I, I personally kind of bristled at it a little bit of like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm here to teach designers. And actually what I got out of it is that I have a conversation with these conventions or these this, his, this historical foundation of theater all the time, and to understand that is actually to kind of empower your current moment, and I think a lot of what's being said here is that if you're going to move into the world where you're making work, you have to not only, it can't, it can't be a one-off moment of this moment. It's, it's built on something else, and I'm saying this really poorly, but I, I, I guess I really feel like in order for us to talk about sound and further it and help people understand it, we, we, we need to get people out of this kind of information of the moment kind of thinking and into a kind of deeper conversation. And it's an argument I know we're having in our department of even around um, theater history is when do our students even get to go in deeper and not just kind of have an, old, you know, an umbrella look at this, but actually really <laughs> get to go deep into a subject area. And, and, the, and I'm, I'm so shocked at people's fear of, um, you know, what happens if you know one thing, a lot about one thing. Well, that's actually really valuable because you've gone deep and that you can bring that experience to any conversation, really. And um, I don't know how to articulate that better, but it, it, I do think it's an argument. Mm -hmm. um, that, yeah, we can go on, on the internet and find out facts and research about a lot of different things, but to actually write a thesis on something and do a, do a real analysis of a particular playwright or a, a moment in theater history it is going to change you and you're going to bring that to your work and I, I feel it's really important. Yeah, that's great and, and I think we do have time for the, the next two questions so we're going to go there and then over here. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Jessica Hughes and I'm still a part of the uh, academic and institutional theater world with students and professors where the exchange between learning and still developing your craft and at the same time being a professional is a very nebulous place to be. And so I have found as a student dramaturg that sometimes it's really hard to understand how much to give with designers who aren't familiar with working with dramaturgs and how, where do you start the conversation to help to teach student designers and dramaturgs on how to collaborate together and where are those bridges that each party can cross so that they can learn their, how to share their voice when they come into the professional world. I, I think, um, and I, I'll just be brief on it, but I, and I wonder what you guys will, will think. I think, and it's right onto what Louisa was saying, which is that every way in which you refine a deep connection to something and activate your mind around it, the very process of doing that becomes itself transmutable to other things. Going deep with something means your mind can then begin to move laterally and go deep with lots of things. So, for example, for you, as I was listening to you, I was imagining the dramaturg being near conversations that were happening. Just being very present and listening, all these words are gonna drop in and there will be points of entry for you to, to flow into that conversation and nudge it, divert it, complicate it, please complicate it and and that so your point of entry would it be so much about you know when is my time to come or is there a forum for me to begin it's more about your role I think as one 
Because as I think ultimately aesthetics are most affecting when your relationship to, the, to what's occurring becomes complex in a good way, time-based time complexity of engagement, but also problems that you have to kind of work on. So I think your role could literally could just be that of someone who is complicating what seem to be simple outcomes. That's great, that's beautifully said. I mean, I, I think it's often the case, you know, as people are sort of trying to figure out how to do these things exactly at this place you're talking about, you know, everybody wants to, um, I would say, approach all of those conversations with more questions than answers and, and with a spirit of generosity. I mean, there's, there's, a funny, there's a funny line in all of this stuff and everybody particularly right where you are is still finding it, right? But um, it takes, it, it takes an enormous amount of um, ego and, and belief in yourself to do any of these jobs. And there's a certain point where everybody's still trying to show that they know how to do them. <laughs> and, and it's not about, it's never about who has the right answer. It's never about, you know, um, pr proving that you're the smartest guy in the room ever. It's about both being generous enough to give and take from that conversation. And I think what you said is quite beautiful. That's great. Um, and one last question, yes. Hi, I'm Sarah Freeman, and uh, I teach at the University of Puget Sound. And for, um, because of the research project I'm working on, I'm interested in uh, maybe particularly Rachel and, and Louisa, but any of you talking, um, uh, saying something about what the dramaturgical relation ship is like for you as a designer with a, a long-term or a, a repeated collaborator, uh, whether that's a playwright um, or a director particularly, or a dramaturg or another designer. I'm, I'm really interested in some of the notions that you guys have been talking about, the question of the poetic, right, the question of the shared vocabulary, and, and the great dilemma of when do we get to start talking to each other because that's how we build those things together. And I think that those repeated collaborations that the people you get to work with again and again or you choose to work with again and again over time are, are particularly interesting and a place where dramaturgy happens even if no one who is named the dramaturg in those relationships. So I would love to just have you talk about at least w one person who may be that for you in your world. Louisa, Rachel, I'll start. I'll start. I mean, I have to say, I, I'm. I think. Um, I know. I know my work with Sarah Benson. She's a director, but um, you know, I, I really think of her um, partially because of her role as artistic director as a dramaturg. And um, in the project that I just worked on with them, which was a, a, a theater for young audiences project, but really all age audience, um, she kind of she kind of gave us a lot of lot of space on it um, after we kind of knew how the project was going to start to form itself and she arrived kind of towards the end and as you were talking I was thinking about how you know that it, it seems like a theme here of the, 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 when, the when does the conversation happen and the, I think we all I think this ties back to something also that Fitz is saying in terms of like these professional models that we force upon ourselves you know what is what are these calendars? What is this time that's driving us towards some kind of opening? I mean, it often is really purely financial. It's like how, how many weeks of rehearsal can you have? How many, you know, we're all in that, that constant puzzle. Um, and I, I actually think sometimes that the voices that come in kind of actually towards the end are incredibly important. Um, a lot of things can happen with relationships and work that you're in and have been developing that don't often give you the, the opportunity to kind of um, be the best problem solver at some points. I mean, you know, sometimes you need that outside voice. So while I feel like I have an ongoing dialogue with certain people that, that is essential in some ways for kind of trust or confidence in, in playing and, and experimenting, there's this other thing that becomes, so I've had this, I guess I've had this with Sarah Benson on both ends where I feel like we have an intimate conversation from working together very often, but I've also now had her come in on a project that I've been working on and, and kind of offer up some insight. And that, it's so important. So I guess I'd want to say from a, 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 a design place, I would never want someone to feel that coming, not having been there at the beginning is somehow um, 
unfortunate <laughs> because actually it can be incredibly fortunate um, that that you actually can be the thing that 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 provides us a, a, an extra energy to kind of further maybe an instinct that was there that hasn't been acted on or in many cases to kind of pull back from something that we just that needs to be pulled back on and I, I so I don't know I'm, I'm into the 11th hour sometimes I think that it's very very important moment <laughs> It's really beautifully said. I mean, it's really, really, really true, and that that helpful late perspective can be a game changer. <laughs> um, I'm very fortunate in having very many, many, many very long relationships with an awful lot of really terrific directors and playwrights, actually, as well. Um, and it's amazing to design. You know, the I'm now designing my sixth play for Naomi Wallace, and it's inc it's incredible because. I have an intimate relationship with her work over time. That's so rare and extraordinary. Of course, my greatest collaborator is my partner of 18 years, which I cannot believe I can say. Um, director <laughs> and now playwright, Lisa Peterson. I know, can you believe it, Mark? <laughs> it's like, it's unbelievable. So that relationship, right? I mean, that's one of a kind because that, cr that crosses so many, um, you know, the conversation crosses every single line and it's so, that, but that work has a real evolution to it, um, and she, you know, I, I can't, I almost can't even talk about it because that relationship is so completely, you know, deep in my, the way that I think for so many years now. But, you know, much like Louisa was saying, there are days where I'm, you know, where I'm like, will you come in and look at this with me, even though you're not directing this play, I need your eye, I need your perspective, I, I, I'm lost in the mud on this, and, and I need that help. Um, but you know, it's a, it's an incredible. I mean, those the relationships I have. I, I, I'm not even sure how to talk about this, except for to say that this thing that Louisa said is amazing. Of bringing in the new the new perspective into that is incredibly valuable. It's just great. It's great. Um, and, and I know that we're we're running out of time um, for the formal conversation. But of course. Um, we have a little break here uh, after where everyone's going to be moving around, and I want to encourage everyone to come and speak with the panelists, and definitely to take um, all of the issues of Chance Magazine that are out on the tables, even though we're all going to get one in the mail, pass it on to um, pass it on to a friend, uh, pass it on I to I a have trusted a few collaborator. More. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're very heavy, <laughs> and I brought them, and it would just be great if you would just take them. Yes. Help him out, yes. carry them along. I want to thank our panelists, Fitz, Martha, Rachel, and Louisa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vicki. That was amazing. Thank you, guys. Um, a quick moment of housekeeping, although it feels a lot better in here. 90 minutes ago, it was miserable. Um, so I have made arrangements. The Bly Grant and the AGM are going to happen in the faculty room with the air conditioning. So just note that for the schedule. So run to the bathroom. You caucus is in here. Uh, power is in the faculty room. Thanks, guys. <laughs>